Tell me something about Terry Spall. Well, um, just a guy that fixes teeth for a living, I guess, and okay. uh, picked up on some exciting stuff over my career, and it's uh, turned out to be a very uh, compelling and motivating and exciting time. So, where were you born? I'm a native of St. Louis, Missouri. I grew up there for a while and then moved around the country with my family. My dad's job took him to various cities and he was in the brewing industry and uh, finally uh, became the head brewmaster for a major Midwestern brewery in St. Paul. And that's uh, about the seventh grade, I think, we moved there. And when did you decide that you were going to be a dentist? I suppose one of the real seminal moments was about the eighth grade, and they had a career day, and uh, they passed out a bunch of brochures on different types of career, teaching, engineering, and the little two-page brochure on dentistry looked kind of interesting. Um, I had always received compliments from adults throughout my life for my manual dexterity projects. I would build model ships, model airplanes, paint them, and, and uh, just something that appealed to me. And my dad said, you know, you're good with your hands. You should get into something like that. So you never felt the inkling to follow your father's footsteps? I wouldn't be allowed to. <laughs> I'll give you a little anecdote. In those days, the simple facts are uh, unions were extremely powerful and companies had to negotiate contracts for labor with unions and it was a very, very difficult procedure. And my dad had to participate in those negotiations and deal with that and uh, he said, listen, you work for yourself then you're your own boss, you don't have to deal with all the headaches of the business world. And that was it. I said, okay. So where did you go to school, dental school? I uh, attended the University of Minnesota, graduated in 1969. And from there? Well, uh, back then the Vietnam War was on, so uh, I was a Vietnam War volunteer. Um, when the country's at war, that's what I was taught you do. My dad was a highly decorated World War II hero, although he never talked about it. And um, being a dentist, I figured, well, I won't see combat, hopefully, but at least I can help the troops out that are becoming injured over there. Uh, I didn't wind up in Vietnam. They sent me, uh, I was assigned to the 354th Tactical Fighter Squadron in Kunsan, Korea. That's, so you, you served as well, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, that's wonderful. And so what, what was the calling moment when you thought, I would start wanting to treat pain and headaches and help patients who are chronically in sympathetic dystrophy? Well, um, it might have been uh, sort of a backdoor experience. I realized that these people uh, had a lot of suffering and it was kind of secondary in my consciousness. And uh, way back in the early days when John Witzig was first starting and Harold Gelb was first starting, I saw some of their early lectures and was quite inspired by that. Again, it was a little two-page brochure uh, that uh, John Witzig had sent out and it showed a before and after that was obtained with functional appliances. And I thought, how did he do that? And it was more of a curiosity than anything. And once I realized that there was uh, a technique that re represented a 
an enormous paradigm shift from what had already been established, in other words, the fixed appliance methods. Uh, it just seemed to m be a um, logical thing, and uh, it kind of slowly formed a synthesis in my mind. It wasn't quite as immediate as one might think. I would like to make everybody realize that uh, if you'll f forgive a little humor and a little uh, oversimplification, I, I'm a convert. I was steeped in the old ways and did some ortho on the practice, simple things, and referred what looked to be bicuspid extraction cases out. And um, I saw this different philosophical approach, and I started seeing the patients come back, and I saw something I didn't like. I mean, you could see what these newer ideas were pointing out. My sisters had orthodontics. One was an extraction case, one was not, and the differences are just incredible. The one that did have extractions, by the way, was a severe migranor in her adult life, married to a physician, a hunting and fishing partner for my whole life, my brother-in-law, who couldn't control them. And, um, I think to myself way back 35 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, this stuff might be true sometimes. And as I administered these types of treatments, I go, well, you know, this is true sometimes. And then it became, well, this is true a lot of the time. And then it became, boy, this is just about always true. And now I want it chiseled in my tombstone. <laughs> This is the way it is. So you were mentioning before about John Witzig. Um, you and John wrote three of the most widely read textbooks in orthodontic history. Um, so what are your impressions of working with John Witzig? Uh, first of all, it was a thrill. John's a great guy, and I miss him. Um, it was very straightforward very uh, right to the point, fearless. In fact, uh, again, uh, by way of inside knowledge, uh, I was approached by some people behind the scenes who at their request will remain unidentified to write a little book about bionators. A little book? <laughs> Three volumes later. <laughs> That's another story. But uh, what was happening way back then was the doctors would go to the meetings and see the results with their own eyes. And uh, I've seen uh, times where Dr. Witzig would put the final pictures of the case up before the audience and compare it to the pretreatment cases you know, the pre-treatment occlusion, the pre-treatment face, before and after, right next to each other, put the slide up and say nothing. And all of a sudden, the audience broke out in spontaneous applause. They knew what they were looking at. But when they got back to the office Monday morning, they went, now, how did he just do, how do you, bend this wire? How do you grind that acrylic? How would you? So um, I was approached and uh, being a young, enthusiastic, loose cannon <laughs> in the industry, I uh, remember saying to some of these people, uh, if I write this, who's going to publish it? They said, don't worry. You walk into any medical textbook publishing house with a manuscript about functional appliances. They'll stop the presses. They'll publish it. Don't worry. 
So uh, I developed about a 200-page manuscript, and it's kind of a... And that was the genesis. Yes. And uh, we approached somebody, took it to Dr. Witzick at a meeting. He stayed up till 2.30 in the morning reading it and said, you tell that young man I'm behind him 100% because what we needed was case photography. So we started collaborating and I would go over to John's house and after work some evenings and show him a few pages of the manuscript and how I was developing it and said, well, John, what do you think about this? Or how do you like that? Or I'd ask him a few questions that maybe he didn't quite know the answers to yet. And he said one night finally, and I'll try to imitate him. For those of you that never heard him, he had a distinct way of speaking. Terry, hey, hey, Terry, you, you dear person, you, you know what to write. Just write it. And that was it. Uh, <laughs> three volumes. Later, we had the completed uh, project because I saw it as a um, Wagnerian uh, change. Uh, John did have a tendency to make it look a little simpler than it was, but um, I wrote the uh, texts as if you were going to send a group of young dentists to Mars and that was the only resource they would have. Uh, they would have enough knowledge to get through most of the cases, not all. Specialists are still required. Special cases take special knowledge, special skills, special effort. But uh, it represents, I think, a change from the old way of a very, very limited model. Uh, are there any more volumes in the works? Are uh, there any more books on the way? There's, um, yes, there's a volume four that is a uh, compilation of the advanced techniques that speed up everything as far as the new way of instead of constriction and tooth moving only appliances. It's the movement is now, of course, develop where needed, get the joints right, get the airway right, and much faster, more efficient, more surefire ways of doing the same thing without abandoning the old techniques. Uh, it's a dogfight right now <laughs> between me and a, and a prospective publisher, whether they're gonna do it the way I tell them or not, but uh, it may never see the light of day, but. It's laying there uh, being uh, edited. How do you see yourself as a dentist? I'm kind of an odd duck. That's what I told uh, a group of people at Jay Gerber's meeting. Ask my wife. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a guy that kind of stood there and, and uh, everything kind of came down around him and uh, it kind of fell into my lap. The, 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 uh, a lot of things just seemed to come together as if there was a guiding force there somewhere, a, a purposeful intent. And that mixed with um, passion. Uh, this stuff is exotic, thrilling, enlightening. Nothing satisfies the soul better than, as I said, I think it's the last chapter of volume three, the first sentence. There are few things that this temporal world that satisfy, like the triumph or the individual's own participation in the triumph of right principles. I mean, it's a blessing to have a, a cause for truth that takes combat to 
bring it to the surface. Uh, it's, it's so satisfying to see those suffering patients just turn around. So that's your favorite part of orthodontics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my favorite thing to see on the day sheet when I walk in in the morning and look is there'll be an hour blocked out and I'll say, TMJ consult. And if you're interested, I can tell you about how they all go. They've been everywhere, been to a number of types of doctors, had a number of types of treatments, are getting discouraged, but came there because a relative or a friend who had treatment uh, referred them in. And uh, I size them up and tell them, look, here's probably what's going on with you and explain it in simple layman's terms with a few models and a few pictures of TMJ, what, how it works, what it's like, and I tell them, what makes you suffer the way you do is that you got a thorn in your paw and it's bothering the one nerve in the body that's the worst one to do that to the trigeminal nerve because it's hooked up to so many other things. The only nerve like it in the whole body. And nature doesn't like that, so it comes out in odd ways. And of course, the chronic recurrent headache is the chief calling card of TMD. And the migraine headache is the end stage of that continuum. And the thing is, now we can prove it. So, you've lectured around the world You've lectured all across North America. What aspects spurned you on to, to want to teach? You mean other for than having a proclivity for wanting to shoot my mouth off? <laughs> um, share the excitement, number one. And two, not only are the patients suffering, a lot of my colleagues are suffering. They're good people, just good-hearted, sincere, hard-working people. And they're kind of banging their heads in the wall trying to get this thing solved, and the answer is right there. The answer is there. Uh, and the fun for me is in explaining things to them and watching that light bulb, the light bulb go on and the aha moment and uh, the fact that it's uh, an idea and a method that's strongly resisted by powerful forces uh, makes it all the more exotic. And what's the most common questions students and other doctors ask you? Does it really work? I suppose. How do I, you know, how, well, what about this? What about that? Um, they get lost in the details of the individual symptomatic presentations of the, the patient. And uh, they just uh, have sort of a glazed look on their face that, how can it be that simple? in principle. The devil's in the details, but you know, we've solved that. How can it be that simple? And it appeals to them, but they're afraid to stand up and use their brains like adults because they've been browbeat by the academic process. And what spurs you to continue? Uh, you're getting metaphysical now. I'll tell you the truth. I'm so old and so close to the end, I don't have time to not tell the truth. I believe because of this satisfaction that comes in your soul when you see truth triumph, when you see deformity changed, when you see pain relieved in your fellow man, that is a noble process. And uh, I think somehow 
I believe in my heart of hearts that I was one of the individuals picked out by a higher power to uh, spread the message. Spreading the message. You're coming to Australia soon. Beautiful Australia. Wonderful country. I lectured there before back in the old days and uh, I just love it. It's just a glorious country. Drive on the wrong side of the road, but it's a glorious country. <laughs> and what would be the focus of your, of your lectures, your lecture series there be? Okay. Something that is probably identified with me more than anything else, and I'm the only one maybe that represents this. I'll be discussing something far out on the fringe. It's one thing to show doctors how to use an appliance, how to effect an end and so forth. This comes at it from the entirely opposite direction. I'll be discussing the neurology of the ortho TMJ migraine connection. One of the other things I want chiseled in my tombstone in capital letters four inches deep in the marble, migraines come from TMJ. That's it. No other known cause, no ifs, no ands, no buts. That's it. It's a continuum and the evidence is both extremely detailed and extremely prodigious, doesn't come from dentistry. The evidence of the neurological processes involved come from our colleagues in neurology with no agenda. They don't know a functional appliance from Mexican jumping beans but they do the cell biology, they do the neurophysiology, they do the neuroanatomy, the neuropathophysiology, and they've got it all put together, a few missing gaps, yes. But what they all seem to admit is the trigeminal nerve is the mediator of this condition, and it seems to be stimulated by some sort of generator or chronic deep pain source. On a slightly different note, I know that you've been in private practice for many a decade. Um, I have been your personal slave <laughs> in the past. I've worked in, you, I've worked in your clinics and, and I've worked in your office and, and I've learned a lot. I noticed that you have very, very, a very good staff and a very, very good support network. Um, have you got any advice on dentists on how to run a successful practice, a successful orthodontic TMD type practice? Well, that's an enormous question because there's a lot of important answers, but in single word answers, records. Daily records of the visits. You have to establish your diagnosis treatment plan uh, fee schedule, present it to the patient before you do anything. Uh, document whether they accept or not and tell them, you know, there are complications that come along in this business. Excuse me, one of them being heretofore unexpressed mandibular growth that crops up sometimes, even in adults. It's known as a temporal shift. Um, it could fail. It could. It ain't. But with all the knowledge that we have of this, you may need further treatments, further adjustments 20 years from now, 30 years from now. You may have ongoing things, but the primary major symptomatic condition will be greatly abated. How do you find good stuff? Uh, a 
the staff becomes inspired by what they see. It is extremely emotional when you watch these things happen and you delegate to them. You take the impressions, I'll take the bite, which we confirm with a film. You uh, talk to the patients a little bit before I come into the room, inform me of how they're doing. Um, it's an ascension that they sense in their heart of hearts and uh, they get to be, at least my staff is, very protective of you because they know what you're doing. They see the results. It ins ins inspires them and uh, you don't have to motivate them. The actions of the day motivate them. They want to help these people too because they see the glorious results consistently. Okay. They want to be part of that. That's a natural, it's a natural attribute of the human heart to want to help and do good when you see suffering in front of you, especially children and young adults. So you bring out the best in your staff? The science brings out the best in them. What about patients? How, how, how does your practice attract new patients? Uh, I'm in the habit of keeping a very low profile in St. Paul. It comes from years of working on the books. I didn't want opponents calling me up and razzing me on the phone and giving me a bad time. I just don't want to be bothered with it. Didn't have time for it. Wasn't going to argue with them. But uh, the patients themselves are the uh, best practice builders I have. That and, of course, the biopsychosocialists and TM Day. Oh, man. That's another story. I'll give you one small example if you're interested. I treated a um, woman years ago. She came from California. Uh, and um, she was a successful case. Brought her son to me. And um, he had difficulty with headaches coming on. Grades were going downhill. We treated him successfully. He was so inspired that I had him appear at one of the advanced Witzig fall seminars. And he was in about the eighth grade and read a little term paper that he had wrote about TMD. And I had him come out because I had the mother there and showed her case. And then I had him come out and read his little term paper. Um, about how it changed his life and so forth. And he said, someday <laughs> I hope to become a dentist and work with Dr. Spall if he's still alive. <laughs> and of course it brought the house down. Guess what? It is Captain Ross Johnson of the United States Air Force finishing up his tour of duty. And he is a dentist and he is a TMD expert because for years, he'd take his vacations and his time off from school and come to the office and shadow me, and, and uh, pretty sharp. So, Eric, so, Terry, you've been a member of the IAO for many a years. What's the, what's the IAO mean to you? Well, first of all, it's very inspiring to see that uh, one of the clarion attributes of the profession is its members try to improve themselves by their own efforts. The constant striving to become better, the constant striving to seek knowledge, and the constant striving to improve so they can help their patients, i.e. pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. That's been inspiring to me, uh, to see how dedicated people like you are, like the staff at the IAO, 
the daunting part of that is that it, it shows me that in spite of all this effort and energy, they're missing something. They have to keep that energy and focus and point it at expanding the model to include joints, include the bone and muscle of the teeth, bone, muscle, triangle of malocclusion. And uh, they have to start leaning harder in that direction. So what other organizations are you involved with besides the IAO? Well, the, my two uh, primary organizations, and actually the only two that I uh, deal with uh, anymore, is the uh, IAO, of course, and the American Academy of Cranial, Craniofacial Pain. They're the TMJ group. And the, uh, they're the best in the world, as the IAO is to ortho. That's what they are to TMD. And uh, the same daunting shadows hang over their heads also. They, uh, they know joints, but they gotta kinda lean more now in the direction of ortho and uh, functional orthodontics. You, uh, you can't have one without the other. You just can't do it. If you're an orthodontic inclined practice, you can't do it with just steel. If you're a TMD inclined practice, you can't do it with ancillary treatments. You've got to get that condyle right. That means decompression, that means functional orthodontics, and then you gotta finish. Or get somebody who will do it for you, but they gotta understand exactly what you want. So how's, how has the involvement with the IAO impacted on your practice? It, first of all, uh, and this is going to sound maybe silly, but it makes me feel not quite so alone. Uh, a lot of years putting those books together and a uh, lot of years of going to meetings and a lot of years of seeing what was in front of me and not really engaging with my colleagues on the level that I should have, I suppose, from a social standpoint. Maybe feeling intimidated by them, maybe feeling shy. I know that uh, sounds silly for the uh, James Bond, Tom Selleck, Clint Eastwood image I project all the time. <laughs> But um, it gives me a sense of peace. There are such wonderful people, and every one of them. Brothers in arms. Yeah. They're always so kind to me. Well, you, you've been a, a great supporter of the IAO over the years. We've learned so much from you, and you continue to teach us and motivate us and inspire us to do more and more to help our patients. Just a guy that fixes teeth for a living. So what's your prediction for the next 10 years, then? I would like to say something positive, uh, but I think it's going to be a plain old Saturday night back alley dogfight. The good guys are gonna win. The good ideas will win. Name one time, one time ever in history when the truth was obliterated. Thanks to people like you, thanks to the leadership in the IAO, thanks to some of the great leadership in the AACP, it's not gonna go away all at once tomorrow because a bunch of people quote cold and distorted literature and says it's bogus that ain't gonna happen 
the future is going to breathe down hard and heavy, and dentistry is going to have to grow up fast and hard. And I think the thing that'll do it the most is this. The internet. Yeah. People talk. And when the patients come in demanding, this is what I want for my child, this is what I want for my wife, save her by correcting this, the clinician is going to be forced to produce. A world of TMD is no place for short pants. So going on that vein of thought, what would be the greatest opportunity in dentistry now? You mean for young dentists? Mm -hmm. There are great opportunities in a lot of the sub-disciplines of dentistry. But how, in the name of science, can you slam in a group of implants and put expensive bridge work in a patient with unstable joints? How can you worry about the caries index on a five-year-old when they can't breathe right and their jaws are becoming deformed? How can you uh, create a, a upper and lower partial dentures for a patient that needs them when their condyles are going through the back of their eardrums? It affects a lot of what the general dentist does in his daily practice. He's got to learn this. He's got to have it explained to him. He doesn't have to do ortho. He doesn't have to do TMD, but he's got to know what he's looking at and say, I can't take care of this. You need the skills of someone that has better knowledge and better experience at this than I am. But I'm going to see to it that you get that doctor that you get to somebody that knows what he or she is doing. So your parting advice to a young dentist? Learn what the heck's going on with joints. And uh, don't believe what they say about there's nothing in the literature. The literature is replete with evidence. It's in bits and pieces you have to assemble it into a synthesis. Why are there so many doctors doing this? Why are there such a, an absolutely adamant insistence and passionate uh, uh, feeling about this? Because they see the results in their own hands and they save these people. They save the children, they save the teenagers, they save the adults. Pain motor issues, breathing. That science is not going to disappear overnight because a few are in denial. It takes mature adult minds to sit down, look at all the stuff, and go, you know what? I got a doctor's degree too. And you know what that gives me the privilege of doing? Deciding for myself where the truth lies. That's the privilege that goes with a doctor's degree in dental surgery. Very poignant point. Tell us something we don't know about Terry Spa. Uh, in my day, I was a pretty good cowboy. Spent a lot of time in uh, my friend's ranch in Montana. Go out there in the fall for hunting and um, chasing cows all over the mountains and springtime roundup and branding, but uh, my chaps and my horse are both wearing out, so I'm not getting a new one either. Let them young bucks ride up and down those hills after those cows, the heck with them. Yeah, those stories you've told me before are, are, are so entertaining and sound like so much fun. Uh, it looks like fun until you get in the saddle, I'll tell you. Uh, but it is, it's, it's uh, a beautiful uh, ranch that he has. Uh, way back in the mountains. It's, you, you go back 200 years the minute you mount up and get out there because the country's so rough that uh, four-wheel drives and 
pickups and four wheelers don't do it. You got to have a good horse and one with good cow sense and knows what they're doing. And it teaches you a lot about life, especially branding. Uh, they throw those calves down on the ground and hold them and boy, I branded a lot of them and you got to get those irons hot. So you burn through that fur and sear that dermis and that's the way it is. And that's the way a lot of things are in life, including the profession in healthcare. You just got to get in there, grit your teeth and do it because right now that's the way it is. We've had an over 20 year relationship, you and I. How would you describe it? I came out way ahead on that deal. Uh, I said it before, and I'll say it again, the IA was so blessed. It has to be protected by a higher power that all of a sudden when a great need exists, there appears great leaders, you being one of them. I've seen how you develop over the years. I know what you know. Your techniques are impeccable. Your knowledge is consummate, but your leadership skills that's what's important now because you can help the organizations slowly but surely move in the right direction. You didn't get to be a dentist in a day. This is not all going to change in a day. But now that you're a dentist, you look back on DO amalgams and partial dentures and scaling and root planing and uh, composite grounds, pretty simple stuff. But it didn't come to you in a day. So and you're, you're helping that massive movement in the groundswell of the profession heading the right direction. Well, I enjoyed being your personal slave 20 years <laughs> ago. That's, uh, I'm deeply honored to be a colleague of a doctor of your caliber. Believe me, I'm coming out ahead. Oh, no. The honor is mine. Terry, it's been wonderful having a conversation with you. Thank you again for... Well, thank you. You're very kind. God bless you. Thank you.